You mentioned the part of students have voice and we're providing a space for our students to express themselves. For example, maybe they they took a test and they didn't do as, as good as they could have done the first time they took it. And often in our traditional school settings, we we grade it. And then, you know, we move on to the next concept and whatever grade they got, that's what grade they got. But you and I were kind of talking before we started recording about there's something a little bit different approach that you take when it comes to maybe assessments for for our students. Could you share? Our idea is that in a standards based education system, which our nation adopted in the early 2000s, the idea is that every student needs to meet a certain standard. And I will say that not every student is going to meet that standard at the same time. In other words, unit three algebra test, let's say that's on polynomials. Well, the test is on March 14th. That doesn't mean that every student is going to do well on that test or understand or meet that standard by March 14th. And the power of yet, students take the test on March 14th, and let's say they don't do so well, that then they can advocate for and ask for a redo on that test down the road. The idea being that every student can meet the standard over time and that some need a little bit more time. And students say, well, I just haven't met it yet. I haven't met that standard yet, but I'm getting there. And our job as educators is to provide those opportunities. Now, we have found practically, you can't do that with every single assignment. So mastery assignments are the assignments where students can ask to retake a test. And just the other week, I was asking students about the power of yet, and they love that opportunity for themselves. So do parents. And what students have said to me are things like, you know what, I took the test the first time and I didn't understand the directions. Or one girl said to me, my mother was in the hospital and dying and I had to take a math test and I wasn't ready. Another student said, I needed to sit down with my teacher and really go over the material again because I thought I understood it and I didn't. And Sheldon, when we think about the world we're preparing our kids for, Mm -hmm. which is what school is about, it's about knowing where your resources are so that when you don't do something right the first time or you mess it up or you just still don't get it, you can go and figure it out. It's that skill of advocacy and resilience that I think is just as important as the math that we're trying to build inside of our students. So are they taking the exact same assessment? Most times, no. It will be the same standard in -hmm. some other form. And I think that's really important to say, because I appreciate you asking that. We're asking our teachers to do more here Mm -hmm. in a way. I want to just name that to be true. And I think our teachers are incredible already for the work they do. And there's more here for them. And our schools of education don't prepare our teachers for this mindset of that kids being able to do it again. Just like traditional school, elementary school, traditional school does not prepare our students for this kind of mindset either. And so like we're asking something different, ironically, that will actually help our kids in the real world outside of school than what the present system is. And bottom line, when we allow a student to fail a test and we don't address it, what are we saying to kids that we don't think they can do it or that they're sort of almost learners. They're almost getting there, but they're not there yet. And so I think this opens up a dialogue too about performance, expectations, supports, self-advocacy that I find really helpful in the classroom. You know, at the end of the day, I think the question for me, the question should always be, is this grade, does it provide an accurate representation of what a student has mastered or not? Right. Because like you said, there's we're human beings first. Kids are humans. They deal with stuff at school. They get do all these different things. And sometimes they're they're distracted. Sometimes those things or they, they just didn't understand it the first time it was explained to them. You know, that happens. Right. Sometimes you explain it to them multiple different ways. And it's that third way that you explained it. Oh, boom. I get it. Oh, shoot. I should have. You should start it with that. You know, so those kind of things happen. But when we give them a grade and again, the child, for whatever reason, didn't do their best. That doesn't necessarily mean that they have an accurate representation of that grade that they have. So it makes sense to me if a child two weeks later says, you know what, I want to try this again, or, you know, I've done some tutoring or whatever it is, these, you know, my life situation is better. I want to take this opportunity to try again. To me, that makes more sense. Why do you think that's not a concept that 
a lot of us are doing? Like, why is that not a thing, I guess, in most schools? I think it comes down to the factory model of how Mm -hmm. our schools were built. And when you think about just the number of kids that a teacher has in his or her classroom and Mm -hmm. the amount of work it takes every day. I founded these schools. I am the CEO of these schools. But I will tell you, being a teacher for nine years was harder than that. It's the hardest job I've ever done. And so I think the grammar or rigid sort of traditional structure of school is easier to go through because nobody has time to question it or to change it while we are still educating Mm -hmm. kids. Mm -hmm. And that's sad to me, which is the opportunity that I had to open new schools and to start again and to rethink some of how the structure of that needs to be. Like that's been a privilege of of mine, not everybody gets. And this one concept I think is so incredibly important to that self image of student. And I, again, teacher has to be willing to do that. So I give teachers a lot of credit, especially our teachers for being willing. Shout out to the educators that are able to give children another chance. You know, that's, that's at the end of the day, shout out to those who are able to do that. I know some teachers will do extra credit assignments and I, I, I know I had a guest on not too long ago where he talks about where extra credits can often be, what's this camp? Camp was my guest not too long ago. And he talked about how extra credit sometimes can be inequitable because maybe one teacher gives the extra credit. The other teacher does not same class, but one has an option. One class set of roster has, you know, extra chances while the other class does not have those extra chances just because the teacher isn't willing to do the same type of extra credit, which kind of leads me to my next question. Is this a like your model? Is it school wide? Meaning like if you have multiple English teachers, are they all providing those opportunities for students to take that retake a test or, you know, get that extra support? Is that something that's pretty standard professed throughout the school? Yes, we have middle school and high school. So our middle schoolers call it the power of yet. Mm -hmm. And they have a little bit of a different structure than our high schoolers who call it multiple opportunities for mastery or mom, they call it. And so, but it's the same thing. Kids have to put in a request or an appeal to be able to take something again, be able to articulate what's going to be different this time time and why. Then they're given an opportunity to take that test again, has to be a mastery assignment. And then if they do better their grade improves. And I also want to say like in Singapore, for example, who's beating the pants off of us academically in Singapore, we take our strongest and best teachers and place them with the kids who need more time and support to learn something. We don't say, oh, well, you who didn't master it at the time that I had preordained, you cannot learn that. We give up on you. We're moving on to the next thing. We rather we reallocate resources to those who need it the most and make sure those are the best resources. And while I can't do that every day in our schools and hope that all of our teachers are really strong, what I can do is make sure the kids have adequate amount of supports and time to prove themselves in a particular subject area. I set our schools up on an XY axis, high expectations, rigorous curriculum, and high level of supports to help any and every student through that rigorous curriculum. I had a student once, maybe 10 years ago, tell me that, oh, Miss Kelly, I understand exactly what you're saying about high expectations. It's like my grandmother says, says we, all of us, you, me, we are all like fleas in a jar, he said, which I had no idea what that meant. And he said, my grandmother says that if you put actual fleas in a jar, that they will only jump high enough once to hit their head. So if they jump and they hit their head on the top of the lid, that they will recalibrate. And from that day forward, they will never jump any higher because they do not want to hit their head on the top of that lid. And what the student was telling me was that, oh, your high expectations are because we are all fleas in a jar and we have to keep the expectations high or we will start to recalibrate and lower our own expectations. I think in science that's called entropy and support. So while your expectations are high, your supports are there too. So the power of yet is one of those supports. 